Hello, everyone. My name is Angie Vo, and I am a PhD student at the University of Texas at Dallas. And for today, I will be presenting uh, my study, Making a Riot in the Gaming Space, Complicating the Successes of Riot Games Through Complaint. So just a little bit of an overview um, about Riot Games. It's a really big company um, that focuses a lot on video games, but it's going in a little bit more into um, the animation sector as well. So um, it's becoming a really large force within the video game industry and a lot of eyes are on it right now. So um, I'll dive in a little bit deeper into that as you progress along in the presentation. Um, so just a little bit of an overview before we um, dive into the nitty gritty details. Um, I'll do a little bit of an introduction, providing a little bit of context about Riot Games. Um, going into then Riot's PR timeline, um, experiencing just a lot of PR nightmares when it comes to um, individuals coming out about um, sexual harassment, gender discrimination in the workplace, um, and all that. And then we'll go into how they sort of damage controlled all of that. And then we'll go into the conclusion afterwards. So again, a little bit about Riot Games. It's a multi-billion dollar company. It's been around for decades now, and it's proved itself to be a large force within the video game industry and has a really big reputation and boasts a lot of players, a lot of um, customers, and a lot of um, like shareholders as well. Um, so this is a parent company of huge games such as League of Legends, Valorant, um, the Arcane series on Netflix, and etc. They have many underneath their umbrella, um, and so they're a big force to be reckoned with within the video game industry. So diving into this study, um, the reason why I wanted to take a look at Riot Games is to challenge that criteria that constitutes this company as successful. If you ask anybody who is a gamer, um, who is adjacent to the video game industry, you'll be told that Riot Games is super successful, um, super popular, loves their customers. Um, they really care about the player experience, like all of these like glowing reviews, right? I wanted to sort of challenge that criteria. What what does that really mean um, to be successful within this this industry? Is it well, we could look at like the financial side of things, at the reputational side of things and all that. Um, and for me, I wanted to sort of expose that underbelly of the hegemony of play um, just because this company is so big and it upholds a lot of um, hege hegemonic um, frameworks that can marginalize and like different people, exclude certain players, um, certain individuals who want to play their games, so on and so forth. So we'll go into a little bit of that um, and sort of complicating that facade of success again um, through hegemonies and power. Uh, we'll also be looking at Sarah Ahmed's Complaint, which is a book that sort of looks at how complaint is escalated within um, companies and how that is very indicative of who they are as a company. So it'll be a very interesting way of being able to take a look at um, Riot through the lens of complaint. All right, so for this study, what I did was I did a textual analysis of Riot, Riot's PR responses. So we took a look at blog posts, um, company-wide memos and mission statements. So we looked and um, broke apart like where they were coming from, um, their intentions behind it, how that sort of echoes with Sarah Ahmed's complaint and you know how is this complaint being mitigated internally and externally as well to sort of paint a picture of how this, um, this company pretty much works. Okay, so let's dive into Riot's PR hell timeline. Um, just for some context, this is basically the tea. So on August 7th, uh, 2018, there was an expose article that was released by a game journalist on Kotaku, which is um, a game news platform. Um, and this article basically exposed a lot of what was going on internally inside the company. So there was a lot of um, gender-based discrimination in the workplace. 
um, sexual harassment, um, just a lot of things that will go on um, into a little bit more detail later on. But that specific article basically shook the gaming industry because all these people are coming out, um, speaking out about all of this and, you know, what's going on within a week. Uh, Riot Games finally responds and promises to work towards change. Um, and so they were starting to sort of mitigate this um, public outcry, basically, because a lot of individuals were upset and were writing a bunch of articles and comments and that type of thing regarding, you know, the workplace treatment of Riot, Riot employees. Um in September of 2018, very shortly after that, they hired a new diversity and inclusion officer, um, Francis Fry, in order to sort of develop this new inclusive program to sort of make sure that like in the company we're, we're being a little bit more inclusive. Um, a lot of people were saying that this was very performative and that doesn't really address the actual, um, I guess, inequalities in the workplace and like the structures that sort of perpetuated that in the workplace so diversity and inclusion for for them was um not as productive as a lot of people would have wanted but we'll we'll go into a little bit more detail about that in a bit on november and december of 2018 um now th there's this whole snowball effect where more individuals come out there's a class action lawsuit and COO Scott Gell was also placed on leave following some sexual misconduct. And so all eyes are pretty much on um, Riot right now. And what Riot had to do was sort of mitigate that damage control um, online and also internally as well. So after a very, very long legal battle um, in December of 2021, Riot actually announces that it will settle um, $100 million in a class action lawsuit. So now we'll go ahead and go into like the actual like expose article and reception. So earlier was like a very brief, very brief timeline of, and I've only included like the large milestones um, that were very important to this timeline. So within... Um, that expose article and the reception. So the expose article was basically a catalyst for individuals to come forward and say, this is, I've also experienced this. I want to speak out about it. A lot of people were feeling a lot more empowered to come out. And so in November of 2018, um, that class action lawsuit was brought out by two individuals who uh, one formerly worked there and one who is currently working there. Uh, for workplace sexual harassment and gender discrimination. So within that class action lawsuit, um, they cited violations of the California Equal Pay Act, discrimination in the workplace, sexual harassment, lack of company and accountability, um, and toxic expectations of what it means to be a core gamer or rioter. So the last statement right there, um, they basically um, explained that the vibe, the general vibe of the workplace was very much a boys club where like you had to really prove yourself as a gamer. And oftentimes that was a lot more aggressive. Um, you had to like, like if you saw something that was considered um, considered unsavory for, uh, for women, um, you basically had two choices. One, to speak out and be, you know, not as popular or to you take it and you become part of that boys club in order to to gain um you know some social credit within the workplace um and so after this whole class action lawsuit and after the whole expose article um what riot ended up doing is um deploying this whole entire like damage control type situation. So uh, the first thing what they did was called Riot Unplugged, which was a town hall where individuals can come and ask them or, or voice their concerns. And um, people in leadership were able to sit there and you know actually hear like what their employees wanted to say. Okay. And then for external statements, what Riot did was they, they posted 
a couple of um, statements online for people to um, to read. And so they they basically said that they're they've been focusing on listening and learning. Um, they're working hard to patch problems as fast as possible, even though the um, you know patches won't happen overnight. Um, they really want to weave in inclusivity into their DNA and leave no room for sexism and misogyny. Um, and they say that they this is where this is what their priority was until they get that right. So um, in there, they said that they would extend their diversity and inclusion effort, which is why they hired that um, diversion and uh, diversity and inclusion officer. Um, they wanted to revisit cultural definitions and to create a third party review and being able to evaluate and improve their um, investigation processes and systems. Um, what was curious about this statement was that they never really uh, mentioned that they were the ones that were perpetuating that sexism and misogyny. It was they basically said we don't we don't have room for that here, but they never acknowledged that that was coming from their own leadership. So that was very very interesting. Um, so just taking a look at um, all of this in the context of Sarah Ahmed's complaint. Um, so Riot Unplugged, that, that town hall that I mentioned earlier, was deemed as very much performative by female employees. And it was because like leadership was sitting there and they were listening to, they were hearing everything that everyone had to say, but that was just more for them to sort of quell the masses. So Ahmed mentions here that a hearing is offered because a hearing is deemed sufficient to complete the act of complaint, as if to have heard a complaint is to have dealt with it. So the intention for Riot Unplugged is, it can be perceived as performative, right? So we hear you, right? And that is pretty much the extent of what they've done in order to sort of make sure that their employees are feeling okay about it. Um, but when it comes to like completing the act of complaint, you have to do more than, than just hearing individuals. But here, this hearing is a little kind of like a band-aid solution to a very much deeply seated problem uh, within the company. And so after the town hall, um, there was a female employee that sent a company-wide email saying that it just was not enough. And that set off a lot, that basically was a catalyst for female other female employees to speak out um, and to come forward talking about their own experiences at Riot, mentioning how they were still negatively affected um, by gender-based discrimination in the workplace and um, sexual harassment and all that. So this was very reminiscent of the Me Too movement. And it, it, was, it was quite interesting to see how um, an individual could sort of set off and be a catalyst for change, for empowerment, for other people to also come forward as well. Okay. So... What I did was I went into the Wayback Machine and I was able to grab some screen caps from the old, the old pages of Riot. And this was this screen cap was taken before the expose article. So um, they mentioned player experience first, challenge convention, focus on talent and team, take play seriously, stay hungry, stay humble. So within each of these, they had some subtext as well. Um, and just to sort of briefly highlight it, um, player experience, they, they really care about and obsess over every part of the player experience, which is quite interesting when they say obsessed, which is a very strong language um, for Riot back in the day. Um, challenging convention, being able to, you know, upend the status quo. And the, this, this sort of verbiage is like quite aggressive and like quite... Uh, determined to really break through that industry. So keeping that in mind, that's um, uh, very important as we progress on to how they change those statements later. Uh, focusing on talent and team, um, collaborative, motivated, goal-oriented teams, um, taking play seriously. It's never just a game. Games are 
an important part of our lives and we proudly call ourselves gamers by playing lots of games especially our own we deliver player value knowing that players what players value so taking play seriously may feed into um the the general notion of what it means to be a gamer um before the whole expose article um they mentioned that um the general vibe of the places you really have to prove yourself as a gamer you really have to validate yourself um and really be part of this club by like you know being able to sweep certain things under the rug um being able to carry yourself a certain way being aggressive being strong that type of thing so taking place seriously that saber right there kind of feeds into that as well um stay hungry stay humble um being self-motivated individuals, but also being humble at the same time. That is a very interesting um, line to walk. And um, I just feel like it was worth mentioning that leadership should really take on um, these values as well. And being like, you know, staying humble, um, helping each other improve by being open and honest, which is kind of contradictory to how the complaint was escalated and for them not to be able to even have these open and honest conversations about what was going on in the company. Okay. So this was after the expose article. So player experience first, dare to, dare to dream is different. Um, thrive together um, and execute with excellence is also different as well. So now, when we go to the verbiage of these these panels, you can notice there was a shift um, after the whole lawsuit and expose article and all that and all the public outcry. They really had to go in and reevaluate how they worded things and how they sort of approached um, their mission statement. So um, being able to put players at the center of everything that they do, um, Deepen our empathy and understanding by listening, learning, and engaging with players around the world. That is a very, very different statement than what we've seen in the previous one. Um, and now they, they've offered a little bit more of a compassionate way of really showing their, um, their face and their mission statements to the world. Um, we work from best practices, value expertise, and innovate. Uh, we seek unique perspectives, which might be um, a nod to the diversity and inclusion effort that they're trying to push. Um, and yeah, so um, Thrive Together, um, we we cultivate inclusive teams to amplify each rioter's strengths. So again, that diversion and uh, that diversity and inclusion, excuse me, um, diversity and inclusion is still so big and they really weave that into the text. Um, and execute with excellence. We collaborate across teams to deliver holistic ex experiences. Um, and so we set ambitious goals. So so the wording here is not as aggressive. It's still very strong and assertive, but it's not as aggressive. Um, it doesn't really sound that much like a boys club as much. It's very much more inclusive and really like is is trying to show that you know, they're learning, they're really trying to emphasize, emphasize a lot more um, diversity and inclusion. Um, stay hungry, stay humble. Um, so this is, this is pretty standard as well. Um, but this additional section is really worth mentioning here. This was not present within, within the mission statements and, um, in the panels or anything like that. This was after the lawsuits. So our values are North Star. Um, let's say in 2012, we wrote a manifesto, a statement of who we believed we were as a young company still at the beginning of this journey. It served us well for many years, but didn't evolve along with us. Today, we need values that represent who we want to be for our next chapter. So although they didn't address a whole gender discrimination like sexual harassment, like lawsuits and all of that stuff, um, they kind of briefly touched upon where they were lacking as a company. So that was quite interesting. Um, and so they will continually invest in cultivating an environment where each and every writer is able to thrive. 
uh, we seek for, we will strive for fair and equitable processes. Um, our leaders will live the values and actively promote them within their teams. And our ambition is that right will be the best place to work for all those who are passionate about our mission. So now um, they really are trying to like remove the, remove themselves um, from this whole like lawsuit and saying that we we're moving forward. We are working to be more inclusive and all that. Um, but still, the question is they they still haven't really um, touched upon or even mentioned or even like gave an inkling to them acknowledging that they the company itself was the one that was sort of perpetuating um, and setting these hegemonic structures in place that made it infinitely harder for a complaint to be escalated. So um, I sort of talked about um, the verbiage from earlier and in conclusion, um, what I've learned from the study is we really must remain skeptical of PR responses. Like, where is this coming from? Are they truly addressing their their issues at hand or is it just mainly a performative measure in order to sort of quell the masses? Um, and also how complaint is escalated can really say a lot about a company and reflected within the, the lawsuit itself. Um, nothing was really done about these complaints that individuals were being um, subject to these like discrimination like issues until an expose article until something public was you know actually like posted online for the masses to see and to have that sort of mass you know outcry a public outcry of of this being extremely wrong um it took that in order for a company to shift gears and to change internally which is very interesting so and also um on, on that same vein of hiring diversity and inclusion officers is that truly something that is productive or is that just a performative measure for for us um and is that really really truly like strong enough in order to disrupt all of these hegemonic structures that marginalize people all right, and if you guys have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me, and I thank you for your time, and um, it's been a pleasure being here. Thank you.